Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Aki Hiroshira from NTT Corporation. Uh, today, I'll introduce user Unities generation two. Uh, this is a distribution of Kubernetes wrapped in rules Docker for enhanced security. It's similar to Kind, Kubernetes in Docker, and Minikube with Docker driver, but user Unities generation two supports much more Kubernetes nodes using Flannel and VxRun. And of course, it works with rootless Portman and rootless Nado CTL too. Nado CTL means uh, container D CTL. Uh, it's a command line client for container D. So let me begin with a demo. So in this node, my username is demo, and this is not a root user, and I don't have a privilege for sudo, so I don't have a, so I can't run sudo, so this is completely unprivileged user. And as this user, I'm running uh, everything as a non-root user, so you can see that the so kubelet is running, and the control system, and the kubelet by server, Control manager, and everything is running as uh, this non root user. And this node has, this cluster has multiple nodes. And you can see that several ports, such as uh, front end daemon, are running on this cluster. And this is a uh, wrapped inside NAD CTL. So in this demo, I'm using NAD CTL, but you can also use Docker and Potomar as well. So uh, I guess uh, some of you guys here are already familiar with rootless containers. But uh, let me give an uh, introduction to rootless containers anyway. So rootless containers is a technique to run container runtimes as well as containers in a user namespace. User namespace is a Linux kernel feature that maps a non-root user to a fake root user to give the fake privileges that are limited inside namespace. So this technique can mitigate potential vulnerabilities of the uh, container runtimes. So in the rootless containers, the attacker has no access to read or write as a user's file, even if the attacker compromises runtimes. And attacker has no access to modify the kernel. Uh, this is important if an attacker could modify the kernel, uh, they could inject uh, malware that can never be visible via PS command or LS command or whatever else. But in the case of rootless containers, the attacker can't modify the kernel, so they can't inject any invisible malware. And also the attacker has no access to modify the firmware. And the attacker has no access to physical ESA devices, so they can't do app spoofing and DNS spoofing and other attacks. And rootless containers is also used for, for shared hosts, such as high performance computing. And with rootless containers, you can of course use GPU as well. And let's take a deeper look at the username spaces. So it's a Linux kind of feature to remap UIDs and GIDs. And you need a slash etc slash sub UID file like this. And in the case of this file, uh, UID 1000 is mapped to UID 0. And additionally, you also have 64,000 of uh, sub UIDs to emulate multiple URIDs inside this username space. 
And this inside user namespace, UID 1000 gains fake good privileges that are enough to create continuous. But th these privileges are not real root privileges. The privileges uh, are just limited inside namespace. So for example, they have no privilege for setting up virtual Ethernet peers with real IP addresses. So we have to use user mode TCP IP, such as Slurp Pro NetGNS or PASTA or VPN kit. But, and so use, use namespace uh, is a beneficial for uh, security, but it's also notorious as the culprit of the several kernel CVEs, uh, because uh, non-root user sometimes gain the real root privilege by using user namespace, uh, mostly because of uh, buffer overrun issues inside the kernel. But at least uh, it's more secure than just running everything as the root. So if you use containers, you should use user namespaces. But if you don't use containers, and if you just use Linux uh, just for browsing webs or just using uh, text editors, uh, you shouldn't use user namespaces. So Ubuntu 24.04 disabled user namespaces by default, and they added an uh, arrow list to uh, arrow just, just the container runtimes to create user namespaces. This is implemented by app armor profiles. And this figure shows how the networking stack works in the case of rootless Docker. So in the case of Docker, you have a bridge named Docker zero. And you have a continuous virtual Ethernet peers beneath this Docker zero bridge. And the Docker zero bridge is connected to the tap device that is associated with net NS process. And this net NS processes consumes Ethernet packets from this tap device and translates the packets to unprivileged socket syscalls on the host network outside this uh, user namespace and network namespace. So this stack allows setting up network without real root privileges, but the network throughput is slowed down due to the overhead of the user mode TCP IP inside the Slurpro net NS. So rootless containers has been popular since around 20. 18, when we implemented rootless mode for Docker and Potema. And actually, rootless Kubernetes is as old as rootless Docker and rootless Potema. It's been around since 2018. And the patches to the upstream Kubernetes was merged in Kubernetes version 1.22 in uh, 2021 uh, with a feature gate called Kubernetes in user namespace. This gate still remains alpha, but this gate is also used by kind Kubernetes in Docker, Minikube, and also K3S. But the first generation of rootless Kubernetes in 2018 didn't gain much popularity due to the complexity. 
it was, it was based on Kelsey Hightower's Cuban Disk the Hard Way, and it didn't even support Cuban ADM. So it was really hard to set up a cluster with the uh, user in this generation run at this time. And let's take a look at how it works under the hood. So the feature gate is called Qubit in user namespace, but this gate is a misnomer because all the node components, including CRI runtime and OCI runtime and CNN plugins and Qubit proxy has to be running in the same user namespace too. And this Git is actually quite boring. So this Git is just used for ignoring uh, really trivial permission errors, such as the, the message command and CCTA values, such as BM over commit memory. So this Git doesn't do anything really special. This Git doesn't even create user namespace by itself. The so user namespace has to be provided by an uh, external runtime. User this generation run in 2018 used rootless kit, but user this generation two depends on rootless Docker or Podman or NetCTL. But uh, other container engines such as LXD or Incas can be used too. I heard that uh, Chromebooks supports LXD, so LXD is used for, for running Kubernetes inside Chromebooks. And this table compares user Linux generation one in 2018 and the current user Linux generation two. So user Linux generation one was uh, based on the Kubernetes is the hard way, so it didn't support Cube ADM. So it already supported multi-node cluster with front and big run, but uh, setting up, up a cluster was uh, quite complicated. So practically, practically nobody could uh, set up a multi-node cluster with user this generation one into production. So User Linux generation two is uh, uh, re-implemented from scratch using Rootless Docker, Pochman, or another CTL. So this design is quite similar to Kind, Kubernetes in Docker, and Minikube with Docker driver or a Pochman driver. But another example, User Linux generation two supports real marginal cluster using Flanner and Big Sun, and it supports Cube ADM. Uh, but one, one of the drawbacks is that now the Kubernetes node is wrapped in a container, so the host pass volumes can't be used. So to use a host pass volumes, you have to set up a bind amount for the container of the Kubernetes node. And let's take a look at the file layout of user Linux. So everything is just plain text files, such as make file, docker file, and docker compass YAML, and kubeadm config.yaml for ease of customization. So we have a make file inside the repo. So everything is uh, defined as a make file target. So if you run make help, it shows uh, uses of the make file. So for bootstrapping a cluster, you run make up and make your ADM in it to initialize the cluster. And you can run make install Flannel to install Flannel. And you can run make cube config to uh, make the cube config file and you can use kubectl file. And when you run makeup, it uh, calls 
Docker Compose, Docker Compose up with dash dash build. So we have Docker file and Docker Compose.yaml. And Docker file just uses kinds node image. So Docker.io kind this node. So this is a image of kind, Kubernetes in Docker. And this Docker file installs additional CMI plugins and additional updated packages such as M, M sub, sub SD and Sponge and Socket. And we have Docker Compose.yaml. So Docker Compose.yaml just defines a single node, node container. And this YAML also defines ports, such as ETC's ports, Cube API server's port, and Kubelet, and Frontend's ports. And also defines processed volumes, such as slash bar and slash opt and slash etc. And other TMPFS mounts. And we also have cube ADM config.yaml. So this YAML defines uh, subnet and tier certificate sun strings and defines feature gates and also has additional configurations for cube proxy to skip uh, several CCTL values that needs the real root privileges. And this is the usage of the uh, make file. So you run make up to boot the container. Oops. Sorry, screen's not working. And it's working. And you can run make cube ADM in it to initialize the first node and install front node. And then you can run make cube config to make the cube config file to use cube CTL. And to create marginal cluster, you can run make join command on the first node to generate cube ADM join command and copy the command file to another host. And in another host you run make up and make cube ADM join to let the new node join the cluster. And I don't think I have uh, time to show the entire demo, but uh, I think I can try just uh, forming a single node cluster. So just run make up. So this uh, uses request docker to uh, start a node and make cube edit in it. So this takes a couple of minutes. Yeah, so the node is now working. And we can install for now. And cube config is now generated. Yeah, so the ports are now initialized. So it takes some time to start core DNS. Uh, maybe 
Wi-Fi is slow, so it takes time. But eventually, it should be working. And everything is uh, running as a non-root user. So my username is demo. And you can see uh, the processes uh, running as uh, non-root users, like this, kubelet. And the next topic is a uh, match node network. So front node with big run is known to work, and we can just use uh, upstream kube front node.yaml. Uh, but uh, we have to use external IP because uh, the kubelet IP is uh, different from the host IP, and it's not accessible from other host. So kubelet is launched with that's just cloud provider equal external, and you know, the dot .status dot addresses is dynamically, dynamically patched with kubectl patch node command. And also the node is annotated with frontnet.alpha.coreos.com slash public IP overwrite, uh, because the kubelet IP is different from the real IP address. And UDP checksums are covered by setting this annotation. So the UDP checksums have, has to be recomputed with this ESA tool command. And the last topic is uh, accelerating network. So the slow project is, is very slow, so, but uh, we have a uh, bypass for net NS to eliminate the overhead caused by SolarPronet NS. So bypass for net NS captures sorted syscalls inside the network namespace and reconstructs file descriptors outside the network namespace and replaces the file descriptors using SecCorp user notifications. So SecCorp user notification is uh, similar to p but it's faster than p -tourist. And this uh, really makes the uh, throughput really fast. So for example, in the case of a uh, local node, so the throughput can be uh, accelerated from 1.28 gigabps into nearly 50 gigabps in the case of local host. And bypass unit supports both connect syscall and bind syscall, but uh, currently we only use connect syscall acceleration for user units because uh, the bind syscall is already fast anyway. And this is currently available for nav CTA only. And we still can't accelerate port to port communications across multiple nodes. So we can accelerate uh, port to port inside the same node or port to internet or port to node port across the multiple nodes, but we still can accelerate port to port communications uh, across multiple nodes because uh, the big run packets are generated by the kernel itself and can't be intercepted via the second you notify. But uh, we can still accelerate node ports across multiple nodes because uh, this doesn't incur big XRM packets. And this is a benchmark result. So I use uh, Amazon EC2 instances. And in the case of a port to node port, uh, uh can just generate 1.28 gigabits even for local nodes, but the bypass for NetNS can achieve nearly 50 gigabits. And in the case of different nodes, Slapronet NS only generates 1.47 gigabits, but the bypass for NetNS 
can achieve 9.53 gigabps. So this is uh, almost as fast as root rest, sorry, as fast as rootful uh, Kubernetes. Uh, so and future works includes integrating bypassing NS to two kind of Potma. And we also have to accelerate port to port communication across different nodes, perhaps uh, with a sidecar proxy that would forward packets to node ports to avoid the overhead of uh, big run that can't be accelerated with bypassing NS. And Currently, the port numbers has to be statically defined in Docker Compose.yaml, but if you could have Docker Container Update command to support modifying port forwards, user needs could just watch Kubernetes service events and update the Docker ports accordingly. And I'm also happy to help other Kubernetes distributions to support rootless. So k has been supporting rootless since 20.19, but still, still it doesn't support much nodes. And I think uh, Potomar folks might be interested in running OKD and OpenShift inside the rootless Potomar. Uh, in that case, I'm happy to help Potomar folks to uh, support rootless OKD inside Potomar. Uh, so all of my talk. Uh, any question? Only have time for one or two, but we could do one quick. Yeah, well, because if, if you don't mind just letting the next speaker get plugged in to the question. Oh. You mentioned um, host path volumes are supported. Are there any limitations with storage? And actually, how does it work? Do, do the files get remapped to the right ownership so that, they, that, that, that you can access them in a user name space? How does that work? Uh, yeah, so you can use host plus volumes, but uh, the uh, plus has to be defined in Docker Compose YAML because we are now uh, wrapping a node inside the Docker container. So you have to uh, modify the Docker Compose .yaml file to Add host pass volumes like this. So, if any container wants to use a host path volume, you needed to configure the cluster ahead of time. So, you, for all the nodes, you have to modify this Docker Compose file. Okay. Thank you. Any other question? <laughs> 